Hey, it's Chuck today. Throw the ball! Let's get it. And I don't think he's going to throw the ball as much as he thinks he's going to throw the ball now that Chip Kelly's on board. And I'm happy about that. More quarterback. Um, the truth is, Ryan Day has made a change philosophically. But it's none of those. You all know who wins. LSU is the drunkest fan base in the country. To start, that means we've got... I bought in on Julian Sayan as a special quarterback when I did a video a few weeks ago titled Sayan vs. Air. And I did a deep dive on those two guys. Now, when he was coming out as a recruit, I was jealous that he went to Alabama, but I quickly forgot we had Aaron Nolan in the class. I was content with that. Um, and it was what it was. I now think he's going to be the next great quarterback at Ohio State. And the level of excitement around Saiyan is spreading by the day. And we've seen next to nothing as far as our own eyes, as far as practice footage from him, because the media has been locked out of practice from the second practice until heading into the eighth practice on Saturday, tomorrow. So our eyes have seen next to nothing, but the hype is coming from inside the facility and from the people in and around the program. People who normally try to tamp down expectations for young players and keep the largest, loudest fan base in the country from creating crushing pressure and impossible expectations for underclassmen. And that's what makes this so unique. We've known about J.J. Smith. We've discussed his impact as a freshman for over a year now. He's a once in a few decades freshman and not a once in a few decades freshman at Ohio State but in all of college football. And the looks on the faces of the fellow players, when they're asked about him, what they're seeing out of him, it's all we need to confirm what's going on with, with J.J. Smith. Absolute freak show. But I don't think the biggest Julian Sand supporters expected this from him. He's a freshman quarterback, which makes him much different than a freshman anything else. Even in the very rare cases when we see physical talent, out of a freshman quarterback that's at a starter level, the grasp, grasp of the playbook is never anywhere near good enough to start as a freshman. Not at a big-time school. You would need to be a quarterback savant to do that. You'd need to be something different. Um, it, look, it just looks different. It looks different to me. Special. Everything he does looks special. And obviously, I feel that way about Julian Sane, and I've used those words to describe him because it really doesn't take a football whiz to see this guy in action and not notice that. Are we getting way out in front of ourselves with some of the predictions for Julian Sane for this season? Yeah, most likely. But we don't need to look back too incredibly far to see a special quarterback come out of high school with a ton of hype and take over his team during the season. And coincidentally... I was there to watch his first start in Clemson, South Carolina against the Syracuse Orange Men when Trevor Lawrence started his first game after he had been splitting time with Kelly Bryant early in the season. He had made it clear that he was the number one option moving forward. And Trevor was knocked out of that game with a concussion. Clemson pulled it out late against Syracuse. The Tigers were the number three ranked team in the country, bringing back a guy in Kelly Bryant who had just taken them to the playoffs. He was a very solid starter, a steady starter, not Deshaun Watson, not even Taj Boyd before him. But Dabo, for all his criticisms, pre-transfer portal craziness and NIL, did a masterful job of running a program. We talk about great coaches a lot. And to me, there's really two categories. Dabo employed great coaches. He oversaw great coaches. One of them was defensive coordinator Brent Venables, there forever with him. Brent Venables is now the head coach at Oklahoma, where he's attempting to be the boss of a blue blood program. I don't think Venables is going to succeed at the level necessary at Oklahoma to be the boss. But he'll still be a great coach. But Daba was a boss, the boss of a program, and he saw something special going on in his program. The number one freshman quarterback in the country was on his roster. His team was a national championship contender who had just won it the year before last. He felt the energy in the building. When Trevor Lawrence was at practice, he saw the guy's whispers. He knew what was going on, and he rolled the dice on that freshman number one quarterback in the country, and the kid proved him right. And I will always respect Davo, Davo for that move because it was an absolute boss move. Stones. 
And Ryan Day now sits in a similar situation. He is the boss of the bluest of the blue programs in the country. He's been a successful head coach, a very good head coach. But in a sense, this year, he hung up his whistle to just be the boss. He came into the spring with a transfer senior Big 12 champion quarterback who has a lot of question marks and a redshirt sophomore who has a lot of talent, but a lot of question marks. And then he got himself the number one freshman quarterback in the country. And he's watching this hype build. And he's hearing the whispers inside the locker room and inside the Woody. Kelly Bryant started that season for Clemson. And Will Howard or Devin Brown will likely start this season for the Buckeyes. Trevor Lawrence got a lot of work from game one on. For that to happen in this situation for Julian Sand, I think probably it's going to be necessary that when the starter is named, either Will Howard or Devin Brown transfers. I think it's probably a safe bet to say that Julian is going to pass Lincoln Kineholz, who was also in his very first spring. And let's also remember that they're all learning Chip Kelly's. They're calling it, you know, tweaks to the offense. I think it's going to be a little more than tweaks. And they're all learning this together at the same time. And Will Howard, he came in with zero jump on Julian Sand in regards to any of this playbook. They're learning at the very same time. Now, from what we know of Julian Sand, as a grade school kid breaking down football plays on a whiteboard, studying local quarterback hero Bryce Young in his spare time for fun, working with a personal quarterback coach, and keeping a program on his iPad to study defensive coordinators in his conference in high school as a freshman, I don't think it's a stretch to say that he's going to pick up this Ohio State offense just as fast or faster than Will Howard and probably Lincoln Kineholz as well. From a talent perspective, he's a better passer than either of them already. Any of us could watch the tape of those three and see that rather quickly. Devin Brown, not so much. Devin's got a ton of our talent, but he struggles with accuracy, particularly in mid to short range throws for whatever reason. So from an accuracy perspective, Julian is probably more naturally gifted than all three of those guys. Devin Brown's probably going to be standing above the pack right now when it comes to knowledge of the offense and Ohio State experience for whatever that's worth. So if we're under the impression that both Will Howard and Devin Brown will be on that roster game one, then I think the odds go down significantly that we're going to see any of Julian Sane playing this year. But if a starting quarterback is named in one of those two transfers, then I think Julian is going to be the one coming in to finish out those games early in the season that get out of hand. And I think that we're going to see something a little different in how Ryan does that this year where that guy may be coming in much earlier than he otherwise would have. And if he can look like he's looking now in practice, the boss is going to have a serious situation on his hands, a serious decision, much like Dabo had in 2018 with Trevor Lawrence and Kelly Bryant. Trevor won that job by game five, and Kelly Bryant was out the door shortly after. And Trevor took them to a national championship. I sat down to do this show today <laughs> And tell you guys, I needed to pump the brakes on myself with Julian Sand because I was just getting a little too excited and a little too out far in front of myself with the possibility of Julian potentially playing this year. And I texted my buddy Dan, and I said just that to him. I told him, I think we're getting a little too far ahead of ourselves with the Julian Sand stuff, and he agreed. Then I sat down, and I started thinking more about it, and I started thinking about Clemson, and I started thinking about that year and how Dabo managed Trevor Lawrence and what would have happened if he didn't do it? And the similarities of the entire situation are very eerie. The only difference was Dabo had a returning starter that had just led them to the playoffs. Ohio State doesn't have that. They got a big old question mark. Julian's build is slight. Trevor Lawrence was a unit at 19 years old. That's a big difference. Julian looks a little frail, but he's not weak. He's tough. I've seen him tough. He's tough. You can see it in the film. He's tough. He's a tough kid. That doesn't necessarily mean he's going to be able to hold up when we're talking about playing at the highest level of college football. So that's a concern. There's no getting beyond that. But 
if he was as big as Trevor Lawrence, he would also be a very famous kid because that's how incredible he is in every other way. The fact that he's not that big is why a lot of people are just learning about him right now. Everybody knew Dylan Rayola's name, you know, a while back because he's a big, imposing kid. Nowhere near the talent that Julian Sain has. So do I really need to pump the brakes? I'm starting to think maybe I don't. But I still think we would need to see a transfer out of those top two guys for that to happen. And I also got to remember that when we're talking about a freshman and when we're hearing the people saying what they're saying about the freshman, that they were going into it with the eyes of expecting to see very little out of him because he is a freshman. So when they're super surprised, it may just very well be Julian Sain is playing as good as those two guys that are projected to start. And that would be so shocking because he is a freshman and the expectations would have been so low that it's coming out as incredibly uh, excited and a lot of praise for Julian Sain, but really we're talking about three guys that are playing even and nobody's really separating themselves. That's what it could be. I'm trying to think of any way because I just can't remember a period like this where we've heard so much noise from behind the scenes about a guy that hasn't played yet. We heard it about Dwayne Haskins when he was a sophomore. And Dwayne Haskins was incredible when he hit the field. We heard a lot of this noise. But a guy in his first spring practice as a freshman, no. You got to wonder, with all the craziness we've seen in the last three months, would the outcome of Julian Sayan potentially playing, not starting, but playing as a freshman, significant playing time, would that be the craziest thing of all the stuff we've seen? And I don't think it would be. I still think that the craziest thing we've seen is the acquisition of Chip Kelly as the offensive coordinator, stepping down from UCLA as the head coach. I think that's one of the all-time craziest things we've seen in our, in our college football lives. We're not talking about P.J. Fleck leaving Minnesota to come be the offensive coordinator. We're talking about Chip Kelly, one of the greatest offensive minds in the last 20 years, leaving UCLA, formerly a great job at a great place, at a great school, to be the offensive coordinator under his protege. I mean, any way you slice it, this could go down in the books as, and it just might, as, as, a, as a season to remember all around the country at Ohio State, because all the eyes are on Ohio State. Everything that's gone on, the intrigue, the interest, and the Julian Sayan thing just adds a whole other layer. But you got to think that a guy like Chip, whether Julian Sand really fits into what Chip loves to do best or not, I don't think he does. But I think he probably respects the heck out of Julian because Julian is a lot like him. We're talking about two guys who like to just dissect the minutia of football offense. And I would imagine they're probably clicking over that. Two peas in a pod. But this is part of the fun of being a fan, man. So I'm not going to chill out. I've decided. I think this offense can probably hum with Chip Kelly and Will Howard at the helm. I think he, Chip, can play to the strength of his guys better than anybody else can in college football, and I think that he can disguise deficiencies just as well. But if we get to a point in a playoff game where we're evenly matched, and it comes down to a quarterback needing to win a game, I really hope we're not in a position well, we're thinking, what if they would have got the kid ready? Because we have had too many damn what ifs lately. Hey, it's Juck, and my bookie has some free cash for the Juck on Bucks audience. Open up an account today at my bookie, and we're going to get a 50% deposit bonus of up to 1000 bucks in free bets with the promo code Juck. If you're new to sports books, this is a good one to start at. And if you're an old vet, they got everything we want. It's very simple to use. You can pull out your winnings instantly, and they have an extensive selection of wagering options, including straight bets, parlay bets across sports, odds boosts, and even free plays pop up every now and again. If you like props, they got a whole slew of those, and these guys even got a casino over at MyBookie. And to let us try that out, they got a $10 casino chip with our promo code JUCK. 
I like to bet some basketball during the tournament for a little bit of fun. I go a little heavier during football season, but no matter what your sport or your favorite wagering option is, you can find it at my bookie. So open up your account today at my bookie with the promo code Juck because betting is fun, but betting with somebody else's money is even more fun. Check them out. The University of Minnesota and their very eccentric coach, PJ Fleck, who I just brought up, uh, somebody told me that I've been a little too mean lately, so I'm going to call PJ Fleck eccentric instead of what I usually call him, which is a cheese ball. I'm not saying that tonight. I'm calling him eccentric. PJ Fleck and his gophers are not holding a spring game this year. PJ says they want to be able to create more opportunities for people, for dinky town athletes, to get them in to see practice. Now, dinky town athletes is Minnesota's NIL collective. So the school that employed PJ Fleck, one of a kind, to put his Western Michigan row the boat slogan all over their uniforms and their helmets complete with oars, named their NIL dinky town athletes. Uh, I mean, I'm not surprised. But they're doing something instead of the spring game. They're holding a private practice for dinky town athlete donors. Donate to dinky town athletes and you can come watch private practice of your Golden Gophers and I don't know how I feel about it. I mean, I, I do like the idea of the practice, but I don't really like canceling the spring game because spring games have always been a great way for people who can't really afford tickets to regular games, uh, who can't afford to donate to Dinky Town athletes or, or whatever donate it's, donation it's going to cost to get into practice. I'm sure it's not a, a $10 donation like it costs for a spring game. Even at Ohio State, it's probably cheaper at Minnesota. It also lets fans get into the stadium and experience the stadium even though it's probably mostly empty at a Minnesota spring game, I imagine. I don't know why they can't do this practice in addition to the spring game. It's also a good way to take kids. I used to take my kids when they were little. Um, you know, they have the attention span of maybe half a quarter, but they still want to go when they're 8, 9, 10 years old. They still want to go to the game. They want to experience the game. They want to go to the stadium. They don't care if it's a preseason game up at Cleveland Stadium or a spring game at Ohio Stadium. They want to go check it out, but they don't really want to watch the game. They just want to say they went to their buddies, and that was always a good move for that. So I'm not crazy about it. But I started to think about this story, and I started to think more about P.J. Fleck. And if you're not familiar with P.J. Fleck or Row the Boat, it's a really interesting story. So this guy started as a head coach at Western Michigan. They were 1-11 his first year. By the way, he credits Jim Trestle as the guy who opened up a lot of doors for him in his career, and he dresses like Jim Trestle on the sidelines, which I like and respect. This guy's got energy that's unmatched by any other coach in college football. His positivity, and like him or not, I gotta respect it, it's, it's unbelievable. But he's very different, and the row the boat slogan is his mantra. It became his mantra after he lost a newborn, newborn son shortly after he was born with a heart defect. I didn't know that when I first started making fun of him over his row the boat slogan. I feel like a jerk because of it, because it kind of makes sense now. He took that slogan with him to Western Michigan. It became his professional slogan for himself. And then he adopted it to the team. Keep on rowing the boat. It's just stay strong. Keep moving forward one step at a time, essentially. And, uh, it took off in the program. They emblazoned it everywhere on the uniforms at Western Michigan, all over the place. And Fleck turned around that Western Michigan program, and he made them a really good team in the MAC for a while. And Row the Boat became such a thing that when he left Western Michigan, when he got the opportunity to get a Big Ten job at Minnesota, Western Michigan and P.J. Fleck had a legal battle over the intellectual rights for the slogan, Row the Boat. And P.J. Fleck still pays for a $10,000 annual scholarship at Western Michigan to this day for the rights to use Row the Boat. But Western Michigan can still use Row the Boat for any recap of the P.J. Fleck era at Western Michigan. So it's kind of serious. And when P.J. Fleck's name gets brought up, I can't help but think of one of the most unique pregame speeches that I've ever seen in my life from a coach to a player, and I'll never forget it. The Western Michigan Broncos came into Ohio Stadium to open the season against the number one Buckeyes. 
I watch this happen live and I immediately start to chuckle. Then when he does the horseshoe, Bronco's foot, I'm, I'm laughing, right? And then I find myself getting fired up, like want to run through a wall for this guy in the middle of the speech until the end when he does the row the boat and then I'm laughing again. Nothing by coincidence. Horseshoe. Bronco's foot. Horseshoe. Bronco's foot. Nothing by coincidence. You know what, men? Let me tell you a little bit of facts. Ohio State has never won, never won a national title when they started the preseason number one. Never. That means 11 more teams have a shot to knock them off. And one will. One team will. And that's all it takes. There's 11 more, including you. And you have earned your opportunity tonight. Roll the ball! And that's PJ, man. But the dude's only 43. He's had some really good years at Minnesota, some not so good ones, but some really good years. And rumor has it that UCLA was going to replace Chip Kelly with PJ Flick. They ended up not doing that. I don't know what happened exactly. UCLA stayed in house and hired Deshaun Foster, who's been around UCLA for the last 13 years. And he cried tears of joy when he got the job, which made me really happy for him. And I'm rooting for him. And PJ Fleck is the butt of a lot of jokes in college football. But I think before it's said and done, we're going to see PJ Fleck at a big program. And I can't wait to see PJ Fleck on a big stage because the guy is entertaining, that's for sure. This weekend was a huge weekend for recruiting at Ohio State with a ton of visits coming from a long list of top prospects. And during that visit, uh, we got to commit. And we got a commit from a guy who's been a target for two years, had a relationship with Larry Johnson that entire time. And London Merritt is that guy. He's an edge rusher out of Georgia. He'll be going to IMG in Bradenton, Florida for his senior year. He plays 6A ball in Georgia. He's a nasty football player that possesses an unbelievably fast first step, one of the quickest in the class. The only guy I think that really compares to Justin Hill out of Cincinnati, Winton Woods, who I think is an absolute must-get for the Buckeyes. London was pretty much a must-get as well. Uh, watching 30 seconds of his highlights, and you'll see a football player who wants to do nasty things on the football field and also has a lot of finesse. Hits like a brick, engine never stops, pursues from the back, clearly a kid that loves football. He lines up in a three-point stance. They got him standing up, stunts, twists, everything. The kid's got it all. He's big. He's twitched up. He's nasty. Anytime you turn on a kid's highlight and it's nine minutes long from a defensive end spot, you know you're in for, for something good. And it doesn't disappoint. London said, I wanted to choose a program that mirrors my hunger and my pursuit for greatness. And Ohio State is the perfect place for me. Talking about Larry Johnson, he said he wants me to be as great as a person as I am as a player. He wants to help me build great character. At the end of the day, he just wants me to be the best person I can be. London Merritt is a top 100 player. He joins Zaheer Mathis, another top 100 edge player, also committed to the class. Naeem Offord, Devin Sanchez, and Blake Woodby are the three amazing cornerbacks in the class. Naeem Offord and Devin Sanchez, top 10 players. Blake Woodby, a top 100 player. <clears throat> Tavian St. Clair, Unbelievable quarterback, Carter Lowe, great left tackle. Stud linebacker, Tarvis Alvord, who we've had on the show. He's going to be committing on Saturday, and we believe he's going to be a Buckeye. An absolutely ridiculous, but I left one guy out, and that one guy is Eli Lee. Eli Lee, the linebacker out of Akron Hoban. Akron Hoban has become a powerhouse in the last 15 years, and uh, they've produced some of the best players that come out of the state in a while. Um, a couple of them have gotten away. We look at Will, William Satterwhite last year went to Tennessee, a really good offensive lineman. Nolan Rumler, a couple years before that, went to Michigan, another offensive lineman. Chip Trainum ended up down at Arizona State. Of course, we ended up getting him, but did not get him out of Hoban. Well, there's been a course correction. As Jim Knowles and James Laurinaitis went up and got him out of Hoban, and they got him early because they saw in him a very versatile linebacker who was big and could hit and was strong and wanted to win at everything. And this kid is strong. 
and it's no coincidence, he's training under Mike Winkler, a legendary strength coach in Northeast Ohio. Take a look at him under the squat rack here. Wrap it! Let's go, Eli! That boy! Wrap it! That boy! Yes, sir! Keep wrapping! Yes, sir! Every rep! Every rep! Let's go, big dog! Up! 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 That a boy! Patrick! Let's go! That weight and that depth in the squat, and that's important right there. Uh, and that's how you know they got a real program. That kind of strength coach at the high school level is very, very, very unique, and kudos to them at Hoban. They're doing it right there. There's no doubt about it. And it's blatantly obvious with the guys they're producing. Um, in next season, they've got a couple dogs as well. And Sam Greer, Sam Greer six foot eight tackle, um, who's going to quickly be, he's rising up the rankings and he's going to continue to. And then you got Rock Hill, top 10 overall cornerback. He's taken about 10 visits down to Columbus. We talked to Eli about him, and uh, I had a great conversation with Eli. And one of the answers, Eli literally just gave me chills. I mean, what a cool story. He's got a lot of them. Let's get to him right now. Eli Lee from Hoban, Ohio State class of 2025. Eli Lee, welcome to the show, buddy. Thanks so much for joining, man. Really appreciate you coming on. Yeah, thanks for having me. Absolutely. So, We've talked a ton on this show about the class of 2025, which is on kind of a historic pace. But before we get into that, I want to talk a little bit about your high school career. So you play for Akron Hoban, and uh, they've become a powerhouse in the state, one of the very best programs. Uh, the class of 2024 just saw nine guys from your team go Division One, which is absolutely staggering. How exciting is it as a young player to see your older teammates get recruited like that and go D1? Yeah, um, I've loved playing with them guys the past two years. I mean, it's been great, and it's just, just good to see, like, their hard work pay off, really, because, you know, we work hard every offseason with them. And the same thing is, like, you get to watch them perform at the next level and try to make that next step, which is ultimately the goal for everyone. Absolutely. When did you yeah. realize that you were going to be able to most likely get a scholarship to play football in college, which for a lot of us high school football players in Ohio, we dream of never get it. Yeah. When did you realize you got that? I would say after my freshman year, um, I didn't know how like big I would go, but I played freshman football my freshman year for the freshman team. And just from hearing all the coaches talk and really just, I knew that I would go somewhere that would give me a free education. Yeah. Who was your first offer that, uh, well, who was your first offer? And then who was your first offer that made you think, wow, like this could really go somewhere. Yeah. So my first offer, like regardless of everything was Akron U actually, they saw me at a, like a practice that we had at Hoban and they're like, yeah, well, they offered me first, first thing right after practice. And then my first really like big offer that was like, Oh, this is getting real was West Virginia. That was yeah. one. That was the one that was like, okay, now we're getting big. Now we're talking Big Twelve. Now yeah. We're, yeah, yeah, that's definitely big time. Yeah. And what what was your uh, when did Ohio State first show interest in you? So I, they had shown interest in me the summer, like before my junior year. Um, I had, I went to their camps and talked to a lot of the coaches, and it was kind of like we're really looking into you, but like we still need film from this year, kind of a thing. That was like and. So Knowles came to week seven and get to that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So in a game that made a, a ton of people celebrate around the state and, and a whole lot more people angry, uh, Maslin beat you guys last year, seven to two in the state championship and won their first state championship in the playoff era. Obviously your defense played fantastic that game. Um, what was the attitude of the team? How's the attitude of the team been since that heartbreaking loss? I mean, it's – we've really – the standard we've really got into focusing this offseason already is every little thing has to be perfect with our whole team because every little detail comes down to that last play of the game, that last game. Just as you saw, it was a very close game. We just didn't pull it off. Yeah, well, you guys held them to seven and you scored. So, yeah. <laughs> heck of a job yeah. by, uh, by yeah. the defensive unit. 
Um, the last few years, you guys have played St. Ignatius, Eds, Walsh, Massillon, Toledo Central Catholic, Glenville, yeah. uh, and a slew of, of schools around here, like Barberton and Nordonia, that are, are having like the best years of their programs in their history. How fun has it been to play against the best competition in the state of Ohio every single Friday night? I mean, it's great, That which goes back. That's the reason I came to Hoban, really. It was how good can I do against the best in the state and the best competition that I can go against regardless of anywhere I go. It was That's ma the main reason I came to Hoban, to see how good I could really be. And it's just great getting – even with – so now that me going to Ohio State, it really – you get extra reps because you play the best in the state. So it's – instead of playing like some good teams that like we have a loaded schedule every year, it's getting me ready even more, which is great. For sure. Um, obviously, your team goals this year are to finish the job and win the yeah. state championship. Um, what are your personal goals? Um, I mean, my my personal goal is really the same. I would say, like, if we don't win a state championship, the uh, I mean, I want to lead the team. I want to do everything I can to get us there, and I want us to win. Did you grow up a Buckeye fan? Yeah, I did, all the way okay. through. So I remember – I remember last year, um, so I'm from Akron, and yeah, I remember yeah. last year uh, hearing that Knowles and Laurinaitis were coming up. I think I heard it on a Thursday, and I heard they were coming up to Hoban. Um, did you know they were coming ahead of time? So I knew, I think the day before maybe, I found okay. out, and I was like, okay. <laughs> like That's what go. I want to get to. All right, yeah. what's that like? So you know, you've talked to them in the off season, right? You saw them at yeah. camp. You know they wanted to see more film. And now it's Thursday night. You're getting ready for a game. Who is that against? Uh, it was against Walsh. Okay. Against yeah. a rival who, who yeah. is in, in a resurgence um, in their program right now. Uh, really, really good. And you hear the Jim Knowles and James Laurinaitis are coming up to your game. What are the nerves like for that, man? Um, yeah, I mean, it's definitely like – Definitely ner like nerves were there, but I mean, I still needed to like, no, I was like, I'm focused and I was ready. I was pumped up to, I knew I had to do good because this was a big deciding factor in whether they would really put that, put that offer into me and like, trust me with that, I guess. And, you know, yeah. Tell me about when they made <clears throat> the offer. Oh yeah. I was excited. Yeah. He, the next day, it was the next night. He, um, coach Laurinaitis said he wanted to FaceTime me. And so I was like, okay, I've never really done this with the coach before. And so I was in my room and I was on the FaceTime with him. And then Jim Knowles got added to the call. And I was like, oh, something big coming. And they basically just told me right away it was, you have an offer from the Ohio State University. Oh, man. Chills, bud. Chills. Yeah. I mean, yeah. that's just wild. So you got it from James Laurinaitis himself. Oh, yeah. Obviously, as a Buckeye fan, he's a little before your time, but I'm sure you knew who he was. I'm sure you oh, watched yeah. him a lot. Um, that had to be something really special. And you were one of the first commits of the class of 2025. Yeah. Um, it seemed like you kind of just said, all right, this is it, man. I'm, I'm yeah. doing this. Like, there was no doubt, right? Yeah. I mean, at start, I mean, I wanted to explore my options a little bit, but, like, I pretty much knew. I was like, I'm, I'm going to be a Buckeye. Yeah, that's awesome. So you were one yeah. of the first commits. And then you've been uh, – kind of helping recruit. I saw you, you uh, tweeting at Tarvis Alford. Yeah. Um, and TJ was on this show a little while back. And uh, well, what's your relationship been with some of the other members of the class of 2025? Yeah, I mean, I've talked to a few of them. Um, I'd say the most, most that I've talked to, I've talked to St. Clair the most probably. Yeah, mm -hmm. me, me and him have, me and him have talked for a bit. And then, I mean, I, I've been talking, I talked to Tarvos last Saturday a lot and really got to know him. He's a great kid. He, I mean, I would love to have him with us. You, you guys were, uh, well, geez, I guess he's going to uh, announce tomorrow night. Yeah, yeah. Um, but you guys were at, uh, were you at practice together? Yeah, we went to the practice, yeah. Okay, how many practices have you been to now? Um, I would say probably close to, probably eight, I'd probably say I've been to eight. Okay. Yeah, so I've been to, I've been to almost all of them. Yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. And what what are you uh, what are you observing when you're down there? Are you just watching the linebackers? You kind of I mean, it all in? yeah. I mean, I'm in the film room. They I don't know if I'm like fully allowed to <laughs> say that, but they they got me taking notes and stuff. So I, they already want me learning the defense, which is real exciting. I'm I've been doing as much as I possibly can, listening to all the calls, listening to everything like that. 
And so, I mean, they've got me with my notebook that I brought down. They're like, just listen to everything. And I, that's really been my focus. Okay. So you're, you're looking at, at Sonny and CJ fighting for this position. Um, yeah. These guys are uh, just animals, man. When, when yeah. you look at yourself, you're, you're, you're heading into your high school senior year. Yeah. You're looking at these dudes who are just like freaks out there yeah. balling out. Like, what are you thinking? Like, I'm going to be that soon. Yeah, I mean, it's it's cool to watch. I mean, I'm really curious to see what will what the end play will be for who's who's where. But I mean, they're both athletic freaks. They both and we did the film room. They're both really good. So I mean, yeah, it's it'll be exciting. Yeah. So I saw a picture of you um, from Penn State. You were on the sidelines, and you yeah. were standing next to no other than Andy Katzenmoyer. And I'm gonna put that picture up. Um, obviously for a guy my age, uh, Andy Katzenmoyer was just everything. Right. And I was really surprised at, uh, how well you stacked up physically next to the big cat. Um, yeah. I didn't realize you were quite so big. How tall are you? Um, you could say a hair under six, three. So I'm saying six, three, it's like, it's like six, two and seven, eights basically. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. How much are you weighing right now? I'm like officially like 225 in the books and everything like that yeah is that where you want to what, what would you imagine your ideal weight is playing when you eventually start i mean for ohio state it's really up to like i, I don't know how big they'll want me it's up to the coaches and coach mick to where they want me at which i'll, I'll play wherever they want me to like mm -hmm. if they want me to gain 20 more i'll do it if they want me to stay where i'm at i'll stay where i'm at it's just me adding weight or keeping – maybe I'll, I'll end up adding weight, obviously, but it's just I got to keep my speed, too, with that and even improve on that. Speaking of your speed, I think a lot yeah. of people would be uh, would be really uh, quick to call you maybe a throwback kind of linebacker. But yeah. I saw some video of you flipping your hips and heading into coverage. How much do you work on coverage? Because uh, it looked really impressive. Yeah, I mean, so I go to raw talent in like the Cleveland, not quite Cleveland, but a little south of Cleveland, where basically we're all the best in Ohio. We're working out every Sunday night and on any type of coverage, position drills, one on ones. Then we do like kind of a half seven on seven. It's like a three on three drill, which it it's really helped me a lot. It's really helped me take a next step, and I'm still working to get even miles above where I'm at now. It's just been real good. And you've got uh, Rock Hill on your team, who is oh, yeah. a DB. He is the he is a top ten overall recruit cornerback um, that plays with you on your team, um, and he's been down uh, at Ohio State probably ten yeah. times. I, I think I saw visiting. So, um, I, I bet uh, I bet you have some fun watching uh, his skills. I mean, that oh yeah, freak. yeah. He's one of those raw talent guys that have he's really since probably he's probably been going before me even which is like he's just you can tell you know how he moves is just unreal also on your team is sam greer right he's yeah. your left tackle now this kid is uh what he's six eight yeah i mean just a monster man. huge huge guy um, hopefully hopefully we can grab both of them to join you in the oh, yeah. cycle um who's your nfl team um, I've always been a Browns fan <laughs> my whole okay. life. Win or lose, I'm always sticking with the Browns. I mean, it's what my my dad's been a Browns and uh, my a Browns and Buckeyes fan his whole life, so it's just automatically what I loved. As am I. As am I. Unfortunately, yeah. my kids uh, diverted to the Houston Texans. So, okay. what can you do? I, <laughs> yeah. I tried my best. I failed as a father. Um, <laughs> so. Um, I am. Uh, I'm really looking forward to seeing how this class shakes out, and it is. You know, it has the potential to win the recruiting crown. Um, oh, yeah. What does it feel to be – I mean, does that mean anything to you to be part of a class that could go down, at least on paper, uh, as a historic class? Yeah, I mean, it definitely means a lot. I want to be the best. Um, I think I heard, like, it was Urban Meyer, so there's an interview. If, they, if they're keeping score, we want to win. So, yeah, that was that was kind of my mindset with, with everything of my class. Like, I want to be the best class. Eli, I've, I've – uh, so that quote you just said there, uh, first, I'm surprised that you know that quote. Um, <laughs> but there's a lot of people who – I talk about recruiting a lot, and a lot of people yeah. bag on me that I, that I focus too much on it um, and that it shouldn't matter if we win the recruiting crown. I think it's important, and I think yeah. that I think that kids your age care about wanting to be part of that, and I think yeah. that, that kind of momentum builds. 
And I've used that quote a hundred times in the argument. So I'm really happy yeah. you brought that up. Yeah. Um, but that's great. Eli, uh, I really appreciate you joining me, man. Obviously, I, I'm hoping that uh, this class shakes out the way you and I both hope it will. Oh, yeah. And I can't wait to have you back on as we get closer to your uh, enrollment in school. And uh, it, I'm just so excited for you, man. And best of luck next season. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate it. Thanks, man. We'll talk to you soon. Yep, see you. All right, bye-bye. Don't go. Yeah, <laughs> I'll stay All here. right, buddy. I'm going to pause. There you have him, Eli Lee. Can, can you hear me now? You can. One of these times, I'm going to get this right. Uh, I think I've done maybe four interviews, and every time I've either jacked up the audio on my end or theirs. Um, but one of these times, I'll get it squared away, I promise. Or I'll just stop doing interviews altogether. <laughs> but uh, you didn't really need to hear me, because you could hear him, and uh, that was the important part. And that kid is awesome. I was listening to... Um, Bucknuts, probably three weeks ago on the Morning Five, and Bill Kerlick was talking about Eli Lee. Um, and he was showing that footage that Eli was talking about up there at the place he trains at in Cleveland. Um, but Bill Kerlick was really touched by Eli after a game against St. Ignatius in the rain. Bill went to talk to him afterwards. And Bill's, you know, he's like 65 or something. I don't know. He's a little older. Uh, obviously, you know, the older you get, the harder it is to operate cell phones. And Eli in the rain took his took Bill's cell phone for him and helped him put it put the settings on record and Bill told the story and you could just tell that Bill was really um just impressed by you know just how courteous and and just the kid's been raised right he's a sweet kid he's a really nice kid and an animal on the field um and already studying and doing his homework he's impressive man he's an impressive kid and that story about the offer uh, with Lauren Itis on the FaceTime and then Knowles popping in. Wow, man. I mean, just imagine that growing up a Buckeye, playing football all your life, and, and you get that uh, when you're 17 years old in high school. Pretty cool, man. Kids living a dream, living a dream of a lot of us. Um, and that is awesome to hear firsthand. So thank you, Eli. Congratulations to you. Congratulations, Hoban and everybody up there. You guys got it going on. And uh, congratulations to all of us Buckeye fans because we're getting a good one. And he really kicked it off right with the class of 2025. And we're going to keep on rolling. London Merritt added to the class today. By the time you see this, I'm hoping TJ Alford has uh, has made his decision and it went and it went the right way for us. Um, if not, doesn't matter. He's an awesome kid too. So um, that'll do it for my show tonight. And I will talk to you guys on Monday where we'll air the Sunday show Monday because it's Easter. Happy Easter to everybody. Talk to you soon. Chuck on Bucks out. I think this dude's going to be amazing. I think he's going to be amazing. 